Well, uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much. I think I've been given two mutually um, incompatible instructions. One is to talk about the public finances and HE funding reforms and social mobility, and the other is to do it in 30 minutes. Um, but I will, uh, I, will do, I, I will do my best. Um, so what I'm going to try and cover in that, uh, in that time is a bit of an update on where we are on the public finances to give a little sense of the context for changes in um, higher education and within that looking at the way in which public spending actually rather more broadly than public spending on higher education is changing over time uh, and then draw a couple of thoughts together um, on social mobility. So let me... Um, let, let me run through that. I mean, I won't spend too long on the public finances. The reality is uh, that little has actually changed over the last year or two. Um, we are still in a horrible mess, although we have more of a plan to get out of it than we did a year ago. Um, it is the case uh, that the public finances were in the worst place they had been since the war um, a, a year ago. Uh, that at 12% uh, of national income, that's the biggest deficit uh, we've had in peacetime effectively. It's also the biggest deficit within the OECD with the exception um, of Ireland. So that really, is, that really is a pretty dismal starting place. Uh, the government has put together, as you know, a plan effectively to eliminate the cyclically adjusted part of that deficit over um, the next five years, and that's what that plan looks like, a very swift um, fall from that 12% peak um, down, towards, uh, down towards zero um, over that period. The line shows the cyclically adjusted bit. This is what it looked like um, at the time of the budget. Uh, the problem, of course, um, is that that was based on growth projections at that time. Growth estimates will be revised down. My predecessor, who is now running uh, the OBR, has, uh, has made it clear that the growth estimates uh, will be revised down. If they're revised down by much more than about a total of 1% over the next four years, so that's not a, a very dramatic amount uh, then the deficit reduction target uh, won't be met under current uh, policies. Uh, and that's the tough choices that the Chancellor is going to, is likely uh, to have to confront um, uh, either in the autumn when the next OBR uh, forecasts come out or probably more likely in the budget. Um, he can tighten further, clearly, uh, to hit the target um, there is a risk, clearly, of further tightening uh, and its impact on growth in the short run. He can carry on with the current uh, policies and miss the target, essentially put the target out um, a year or two, or loosen in the face of the poorer economic performance. Um, I think our view is that given the debt crises, the last of these looks relatively unlikely, certainly unlikely in the medium term. It's maybe the case he'll loosen a little for a year, uh, but certainly I think it's very unlikely he'll loosen his current plans uh, for, more, uh, for more than a year. What to look out for, of course, in the OBR projections is not what growth will be this year or next, but what their expectations are of the output gap and therefore growth um, into the medium run. Uh, but all the figures that I'm pre pre showing are based on uh, the most up-to-date official forecasts rather than any of the more recent and rather more gloomy forecasts. So how are we getting uh, to... How are we getting to... Um, a, 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 a situation of budget balance by 2015. Uh, well, what you'll see at the end of that chart is uh, six lines underneath uh, the uh, x-axis showing cuts in real public spending six years in a row. As you'll see as you look back all the way to 1950, uh, that's never been done or anywhere near done um, over that 60-year uh, period since 1950. That's uh, in some measure um, a measure of the scale of the squeeze um, on public spending over the period uh, to 2015 and some measure of the, uh, of the context in which you uh, and, others are, uh, and, and others are working. A six-year uh, six year-on-year cut in real public spending is genuinely unprecedented. Mind you, it is following a period of 10 years or more of pretty much unprecedented year-on-year -year increases um, in public spending um, under, the, uh, under, the last, under the last government. Now, I find this uh, one of the more depressing charts that I uh, put up in the public domain. Um, this is a kind of no another way of describing what's happening uh, to public service spending. Uh, essentially, whatever you think is the right level of public service spending as a proportion of national income, getting there that way, um, i.e. moving from 20 to 26 or 27 percent and then back down to 20 percent, is clearly not a very uh, good or efficient or effective way 
um, of ending up back at 20%. But it puts it in another kind of historical context. The scale of the cuts is certainly very dramatic, but it's taking us back to certainly not historically unusual levels of spending as a proportion um, of national income, back to where we were at the end of the 1990s, which was relatively low, but certainly not dramatically low um, in, in terms of uh, historically. Um, across different departments, this, these cuts are very different. International development is seeing over this period very large increases in spending, as is energy and climate change, essentially to pay for uh, uh, demonstration projects for climate, uh, carbon capture and storage. Um, these departments as a whole are doing a little bit better than average. Um, NHS at 0% is doing significantly better than the 12% average uh, cut over this period. And these departments are doing, uh, doing, worse than, uh, doing worse than average. The Home Office and Justice and Local Government and uh, Close to Your Hearts, Biz, uh, doing, particularly, uh, doing particularly badly. Now, um, one thing that's, uh, I think, very uh, interesting is to put some of this into historical perspective. Um, the cuts, as we've seen, are significant, but actually the distribution of public spending uh, is changing quite significantly. And it has been changing quietly, but dramatically, over the last 30 years or more. So now, health, social protection, and education account for fully two-thirds of public spending. 30 years ago, they accounted for less than half of public spending. And public spending is not dramatically different as a proportion of national income now 30 years ago. So why, um, why has that changed? How has that change been allowed? Well, big increases in, um, very big increases in the spending on health, fairly significant increases in spending on social security. Actually, as a proportion of the total, education has simply maintained its share. Obviously, real spending on education has increased, but a proportion of total public spending, education spending has actually only maintained its share. Now, what's happened over that period is that there are a whole bunch of other bits of government which were really big at the end of 1970s, which have taken the strain. Defense, the defense budget has more than half, has about halved as a proportion of total spending. The housing budget has, has fallen from something like um, 7 or 8% of national spending to almost nothing. And support to business and industry and energy has also declined really dramatically. And this just shows some of those changes in a pie chart. There's an awful lot of bits to this pie chart. Look at the right-hand side. Uh, you'll see 29%, nearly a third of spending on social security, the 4% is on long-term care, 18% on health and 13% on education. Put that together and you get to that number I was talking about, very nearly two-thirds of all public spending just on those bits of the state. Now compare that to the situation in 1978-1979. Now those four bits, as you can see, are taking up less than half of the total of that pie and the things that are quite big on the other side, which you didn't see very much of previously, are those spending on what I call TIEE, -E. so this is support for industry and energy um, and, and so on, was a significant bit of spending. Housing was significant, defense was much more um, significant back then. So one of the real questions, and one of the things I think is worth all of us thinking about going forward, is that the OBR um, are projecting that uh, health and pensions alone will continue to grow really quite fast over the next 30 or 40 years, and between them they will just themselves count for half of non-interest spending um, by 2060. And on those assumptions, education spending falls as a proportion of the total. So unless total spending increases, or other spending falls even more sharply, or in particular health spending is dramatically reformed and reined in, there's a real question about how we make, how we make these changes over the next 40 years. As I said, the last 30 years has seen dramatic changes in the role of the state and in the way it funds things. We've got rid of education, well, we've got rid of defense to, to a large extent and housing spending and spending on the economy. Are there other things that the government is going to be dramatically cutting back to accommodate health and pensions going forward? Or is it going to have to make more and more uh, reforms to the way in which public services are delivered? And here, you know, here is the chart showing what the OBR thinks is going to happen to total spending. You see that extraordinary and ongoing increase in uh, spending on health and uh, slightly less dramatically um, on pensions over time, taking the two of those plus long-term care to more, uh, than half of, more than half of public spending. So that's the context. So context for HE spending, context for all other spending that is essentially isn't health or pensions, um, is not just continuing short-term pressure from slow growth and deficit reduction, but a longer-term pressure um, from health and pensions, which 
if not changed in some fairly dramatic way, really will squeeze all other um, spending. Um, so higher education clearly actually did relatively well. Um, you may not feel it, but it did do relatively well out of the spending review. It is seen within government as an important component of long-term growth, and the fact that the graduate premium uh, continues to be maintained in the face of uh, the very, very large expansion in numbers is, is further evidence of its value. Here is just one measure of that, a little bit out of date, but the world hasn't changed much in this dimension, at least, over the last few years, showing the graduate share of employment. And, and this is you know, another dramatic change over a relatively short historic, historic period, which I'm sure you're all more aware of than I am, from 5% from of the workforce in 1980 to a, probably about a quarter of the workforce now as graduates, but actually the premium to being, the value of being a graduate has, has increased and then maintained its value over that period in the face of you know, a huge increase in the, in the, supply, uh, in the supply of graduates. Uh, graduates are, on the whole, still doing well. And I should also say that I mean, I'm, not show, I'm not going to show figures on graduate unemployment and so on, but it, it is clear that in this recession, despite a lot of the, uh, despite a lot of the um, uh, publicity, it's not graduate unemployment that has borne the brunt. It is the, it's the unemployment of the less skilled and other young people, not, uh, not graduates who have borne, uh, borne the brunt. So that is the context, to some extent, of the Brown Review and the government response to the Brown Review, the value of higher education, its value to the students, and the further uh, changes to the shape of the state. I won't go through all of this. You'll know this vastly, uh, you'll, you'll know this vastly better than, than I do. But I do just want to draw attention to one or two bits of the analysis that, um, uh, that the IFS has done, looking at how, if you, if, if you, model, this, uh, if you model these effects um, across time on graduates as they come out of uh, the system and its impact on taxpayers and so on. And this is assuming £7,500 fees, and I'll show you clearly the impact of uh, £9,000 fees. It's different, this saves for each, uh, on average, student going through, uh, going through university. It saves taxpayers about five and a half thousand pounds. Obviously the, the, the hefty subsidy saving is rather larger than that, but the loan subsidy is really, uh, is really, very, uh, is really very substantial. Graduates, of course, are paying um, a great deal back. Um, universities are, are benefiting from this as a, the, the net impact of the fees and public subsidy um, is positive. Students actually today or tomorrow uh, will be better off in the short run, uh, but clearly not uh, once they become, uh, clearly not once they become Graduates. Now, that's, um, uh, some of those numbers may be more or less familiar to you. That's on the basis of IFS uh, modeling of the way, particularly for graduates, of the way in which, uh, in way in which earnings uh, move over time, which we think is rather more robust uh, than some of the ways that is done uh, on, uh, in government. Again, um, clearly, graduates are worse off on average, but the repayment schedule really is highly progressive, and the poorest quarter of graduates... Uh, we estimate, or poorest as in ex-post rather than ex-ante, the ex-post poorest quarter of graduates will be better off as a result of the progressive nature um, of the system that's being um, put in place, partly because low-earning graduates pay an effective graduate tax. Increases in fees simply increase the amount of debt um, written off. Um, so what happened, well, given that fees, I think we all expect to be rather higher than the average 7,500 Pounds, universities get more fee incomes, grad graduates make more repayments, but the most important thing for government and the thing that they've been struggling with and the thing that you all understand, but I think the public simply don't understand about this debate, is that the taxpayer will pay a great deal of money if fees are higher than expected. Only about half of the extra money above £7,500, which is lent, will ever be paid back. About half, um, about half is written off. Um, this illustrates how um, higher fees lead to high earners paying more that have little effect on lifetime lower earners. If you look at the, uh, if you look at the x axis from the percentile of lifetime earnings distribution of graduates from the, for those who do worst in the labour market to those who do best, and each line going up shows the impact on the net present value of graduates' current rate repayment uh, depending on the actual fee. You'll see that as fees go up towards the end, if you're um, if you're in the top half, top third of the earnings distribution, you'll pay back all of the additional money uh, that you're borrowing. But if you're on the bottom third of the distribution, you'll pay back none of the additional uh, money uh, that you're, uh, more than the bottom third of the distribution, you'll pay back none of the additional 
uh, money uh, that you're borrowing, which is, of course, why this is expensive to, uh, this is expensive to, um, uh, to the taxpayer and potentially, uh, and potentially an advantage to universities. This is our estimate, and I think the government haven't put these estimates in the public domain, of the exchequer cost of an additional um, uh, of £9,000 fees across the board as opposed to £7,500 fees across the board. We reckon that that will cost an additional um, £800 million um, as, a result of, uh, as a result of higher fees because such a large portion of the additional fees will effectively uh, be written off. The total value of the loan subsidy grows. The loan subsidy per graduate, um, uh, the loan subsidy per graduate grows and the exchequer cost, cost grows significantly. And that's, of course, what David Willits and government have been wrestling with as they've been trying to think about how to introduce these fees in a way which is consistent uh, with the market. Low earning graduates pay back much less uh, than they borrow. There's an obvious incentive for, uh, for you to charge high fees to students whose repayments will largely uh, be unaffected, although they may not understand that their repayments are largely uh, unaffected. And under those circumstances, there is a straight transfer from the taxpayer um, to the uh, university. Now, uh, obviously, what you'd ideally do is levy an institution specific fee based on the future earnings of the graduates so that you're insuring against uh, your graduates doing less well. The government, for understandable reasons of complexity, have decided not to go um, down that route. But I think what we have here is a basic difficulty um, created by a mismatch between price and cost. And I think this is, a, again, an interesting example for public service reform more generally. If you want to introduce markets into public services and you are uh, for reasons of equity, wanting to distinguish the price that uh, you're charging from the cost, um, the, the cost of providing it, then you're going to create um, complexity, regulation, and something which looks a lot, great deal less like a market than you had originally envisaged. So I, I, I think this is interesting, not just from the point of view of its impact on universities and the difficulty that government is clearly having in putting together a package which makes sense both as a market and something that is equitable, but something which I, I'm sure uh, we will see more of as government thinks about public service reform more broadly uh, when it wants to keep uh, an equitable or progressive system in place uh, while, uh, while charging um, as well and using uh, prices as a, uh, as a mechanism for, um, for change. Of course, all of this means that the effects on competition, and again, um, your views on this will be much closer than mine to what will actually happen, but a mismatch between price and cost will clearly blunt um, effects on competition, as will the excess demand um, for, uh, for prices, as will the fact that in a market such as this with imperfect information and high value of reputation, prices is likely to be seen as a signal of quality um, as, a rationing, as a rationing mechanism. Again, another example of where uh, simply using price, particularly in these complex public sector markets, is a lot more difficult than it appears. So obviously government um, in the end will be a major winner from the Brown recommendations in terms of its, uh, in terms of its own uh, spending. Universities will have benefited. Graduates, of course, are the uh, major um, losers, although the lower earning graduates will, uh, on our estimates, and a significant number of lower earning graduates will be uh, effectively uh, better off and certainly immune to increases um, in, in fees. Um, and higher than, effect, higher than expected fees are a significant transfer uh, from, um, uh, uh, from taxpayers uh, to universities as well as um, from graduates to universities. So moving on in the last few minutes of, uh, of what I'm going to say to the, the last third of what, uh, of what I was asked to talk about, which is the question, what about um, social mobility? There are obvious concerns that higher fees will affect participation uh, decisions and hence, uh, and hence social mobility. That's been a very important part um, of the debate. Now, of course, we start, as you know very well, from a world of very different levels of higher education participation by social background. Here are some estimates that we've done um, using, um, uh, using administrative data. If you divide the uh, world from the lowest social groups to the highest social groups and the proportions that get in, go into universities, you can see that uh, the proportions are really quite low still in that lowest quintile and really very high, um, over 50% in the top quintile. And if you look just at the professional group within that, it's, uh, it's significantly higher than 50%. Of course, what, one of the, you know, what, what that, sh that, that step, uh, 
that, that step pattern is not a difference between the rich and everyone else or between the top half and the bottom quartile. It's a difference all the way up um, the social spectrum, which I think is one of the things that uh, is, is often missing from the debate on social mobility. Which bit of social mobility are you interested in? Are you interested in um, getting that 37 up towards 52 or the 13 up towards 29 or moving it all down towards 30? And I think that's something that politicians... Um, I think quite deliberately, uh, generally don't uh, don't tend to uh, tend to address, and actually they often address quite different things when they're talking about social mobility. When they're thinking about looking at early interventions, that's usually early interventions aimed at the bottom few percentiles of the population. When they're talking about social mobility, when they're looking at um, higher education participation, they're thinking about people rather further up the social class distribution. If they're thinking about internships and all this kind of stuff, then the people probably thinking about people even further up um, the distribution. All of these things uh, may be and probably are important, but they are all different. I mean, all kind of qualitatively uh, different issues. Um, nevertheless, uh, the government has been very clear that it's interested not in absolute mobility, but um, in relative uh, mobility. So thinking again about higher education, we do know, of course, that um, uh, participation in higher education is essentially driven by prior uh, attainment. Um, these are given, um, given prior attainment, what is the probability of going on into higher education? The blue is from the lowest um, social uh, class quintile, the, the yellow is from the highest. The overall on the left, very big difference, given prior uh, academic achievement, almost um, identical. The problem, of course, is uh, that, uh, that, that those from lower groups don't do so well. Now, what we do also know from survey data is that actually this isn't just an issue about aspirations. If you ask uh, people, uh, uh, children at 14, what do they expect to be doing, 50% um, even of those from the lowest social groups expect to be in higher education uh, at the age of um, 14. It's just that their aspirations are not even close uh, to being met. Uh, there's somewhat less aspiration there than at the top, but it's a much less dramatic picture than um, actual attainment. Now, as I was saying, the debate about social mobility, I think, is genuinely uh, confused. I mean, it's confused in terms of uh, what we expect universities uh, to do. It's confused in terms of which bits of the distribution we're thinking about when we're thinking about um, social mobility. There's lots of evidence that, it, as I said, the government has said quite explicitly, and to my, my you know, understandably, uh, but quite surprisingly, that it wants to focus on relative mobility, which means that if I go up, you have to come down. This isn't an issue of what's all uh, going up together. That's particularly hard to affect in one sense, particularly because we are an unusually unequal country. We're much more unequal than we were 30 years ago, which makes relative social mobility harder to achieve than it was. We're also more unequal in terms of income distribution than most other countries. It's also the case that as lower social, lower social groups do better, and in a number of output, outcomes, particularly in the education system, lower social groups have been doing significantly better over time in absolute terms, not surprisingly, the better off the middle classes stay ahead. Here are just some examples of that. The red line, if you focus on that, is the gap in attainment at uh, age 11, the proportions of children with free school meals and not with free school meals who are achieving uh, a level four. You'll see that gap is falling over time, not dramatically, but from 23% uh, down to about 17% over that eight-year period. So that is a closing in the social gap um, between the very poorest, those on free school meals, and the rest over an eight-year period. Now, that is, that, that is a movement towards a degree of social equity to uh, as a degree of improvement. That's at level four. But if you look at level five, um, if anything, uh, the line's going the other way. It's certainly, at best, flat. Level five has become, as it were, certainly for uh, large groups of the population, the new level four. Um, you see a similar thing in some ways at GCSE. Th 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 this is a chart that really surprised me when uh, we put this together. I mean, it probably doesn't surprise you relatively recently. I still had in my mind that the numbers getting 5A to C at GCSE was around the 60% mark. Overall, that's, um, that's shot up really dramatically, largely as a result of the uh, types of qualifications which are now considered to be equivalent to GCSE. So if you look at the proportion, uh, the difference between those on and off free school meals getting five A's to C or equivalent, that line again falls down really quite, uh, really quite significantly over a pretty short period, over six years, uh, you've gone from a 30 percentage point differential to a 20 percent point differential. That's, that's great news, uh, but if you now Ah, I seem to have lost the 
slide. But if you looked at that um, chart, uh, I've, I've missed the chart. If you look at that chart just looking at actual GCSEs, including maths and English, again, the line does not go down. At best, it's flat, and if anything, um, it goes up a little. Uh, there are all sorts of examples of this over time. If you look at the proportion of children from lower social groups who are staying on post-16, that's gone up, but uh, the number of... Uh, uh, but but it's, it, was, it was squeezed out in the sense that those from higher social groups then go on to higher education, go to the better bits of higher education, go on to postgraduate education. Education is a race as much as anything else. And if you're aiming at relative mobility, then you have to uh, make uh, people not just run faster, uh, but faster than, uh, faster than everybody else as they themselves um, get uh, faster. Um, and you also need to be clear whether you're talking, as I say, about the really disadvantaged, those who may be involved in the riots, those who are in the bottom 5%, those who really will benefit from serious early intervention, whether you're talking about um, those who are going on uh, to HE professions and internships. All of these things are important, but they are, as I say, qualitatively different. So a very short and very quick run through a whole bunch of stuff. The short-term outlook for public spending remains horrible. Um, uh, the long term also looks worrying, and I think that's the context in which uh, you probably need to think about, and the government no doubt is thinking um, about higher education. I think one of the interesting things about higher education reforms is that potentially uh, they herald wider reforms. It seems to me very difficult to see um, how we can maintain anything close to our current levels of public spending whilst maintaining the state in its current shape. Uh, the shape of the state has clearly changed very dramatically with respect to higher education. Uh, the question for the government, I think, is whether that shape is going to change uh, with respect to other bits um, of the welfare state. But I think one of the really interesting uh, issues around the higher education reforms is that they do illustrate a serious difficulty of introducing market-based reforms uh, when, uh, when you're concerned quite reasonably about equity and you set price not equal to cost. These reforms are almost certainly relatively marginal to overall concerns about social mobility, other than in a very particular, um, uh, other than in a very particular, uh, particular group. Uh, the government has set itself a very tough target in increasing relative um, social mobility, and um, uh, where, how effective that will be, I don't know. And hopefully, I, I, I guess that Alan Milburn may be able to offer you more insight uh, into that tomorrow. I think I've just about managed to achieve the two incompatible aims that I was given um, in one way or another, so thank you very much. <laughs>